Hello, good afternoon. So happy Women's Day to all of you and thank you for taking the time to attend this talk. Uh, my thanks to the History Department for inviting me to take part in this semester's History Lecture Series. Okay, so as Kate said a while ago, my name is Isabel Nazareno and I've been teaching with the History Department for quite a number of years. Um, let's just say. And for the last six years, I've also been the executive director of the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings, which is a special collection in the Rizal Library of Ateneo de Manila University. And it's dedicated to the procurement, preservation, and promotion of Filipino women right, women's writings and works. Okay. Now, I don't want this talk to be too heavy. Um, so I'll depart maybe from a, a more academic approach and really speak to you mainly coming from my own experiences, okay, these past years. So I came up with this talk not only because I happen to do work for the Women's Archive in my institution, but also because it's an important question. Where are the women? Our country's population at present, I Googled it um, previously, is more or less split in half between men and women. Uh, the figures I, I found set it at 51.1% for men and 49 0.9% for women. So it's right about half. And yet the documentation pertaining to women in history is very limited, often peripheral. And this isn't just the case for Philippine history, but for history in general. Okay. As a student, when I was a student, some of my own professors, unsurprisingly, women raised this question in class okay. and as a teacher myself now I have come across students who were insightful enough to ask where are the women more often than not however the question isn't asked at all okay um so let me share my presentation, okay? Just give me a moment. Okay, so can you Yes, we can all see, it, see it, Okay, great. Yes. All right, so this question, where are the women? Now, if, if you look at the image to the right of the screen, this was, this was one of the projects we did um, maybe a couple of years back, uh, mining some of the material we have in the archive and just trying to raise awareness regarding um, the variety of interests and disciplines represented by the women who are in the collections in Alio. Okay? So, as I was saying, the que this question often is not asked, okay? Um, and if it is asked, it's not asked often enough, okay? Um, I believe Dr. Mary Rosellis um, is somewhere in the audience this afternoon, and Mary might be... Uh, interested to know that while I was preparing for this talk, I could hear her voice in my head asking this question, where are the women? Where are the women? Okay. So I've learned that there has to be a conscious effort to inject this gendered perspective in topics taken up in class because it's simply not part of mainstream materials, especially if you use textbooks. And even if you don't, much of the material you need to look for in order to bring in this perspective. Now, when I became executive director of Alio, it was com 
completely new territory for me. So ALIO stands for the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings. Um, and up to now, I'm still learning. I don't profess to be an expert in women and gender studies. However, the work in the archive, familiarizing myself with its history, the contents, the stories of the women with collections in the archive, gave me, gave me a fresh vantage point for looking at women and their history. And it's something that I can't unsee in a sense. Uh, research I've been involved with recently regarding gender mainstreaming um, has also further highlighted how much more work there is to do. So my talk this afternoon comes from these experiences as a uh, faculty, a teacher, a researcher, an administrator, and an advocate for the archive. Though women are an interest group, they cross sectors and form half of the population. Their presence or absence in history and historical documentation say a lot about the institutions, the society that we are part of and move in. Okay, so before I dive into this question, um, I thought that it would be useful for us to just take a quick look at what an archive is versus a library. Okay, so I hope you see this slide. Okay, so th these are photos of the Rizal Library in Ateneo de Manila. And the photo on the right is what many refer to as the main library. And the photo on the left is actually a much smaller building, the original library, um, which has now uh, been used to house, it's now called the Special Collections Building. And this is where you go, the building to the, to the left, it's uh, three floors. Um, this is where you go when you want to do research in the different archives of the library. We have, um, uh, aside from Alio, there's the American Historical Collection, there's the Pardo de Tavera Special Collections, and the Filipiniana section is also here. Okay, so it's a much more intimate space, a much more quiet space. But how is it different from the general idea of a library? Okay, now one of the things that uh, we have okay, is um, both library and archives have collections of books, materials, mostly print materials that are meant to be made available to the public. Okay? Um, some of the materials may be unpublished. Okay? So you can find that both in the archive and the library. But in an archive, there is a lot more uh, in terms of variety of materials. You have memorabilia or ephemera. Um, and I'll give you an example in a, little, in a little, little while. One of the other main differences is our idea of a library is you go there, you borrow books, you check them out, and then you return them. But in an archive, generally this is not possible. The materials there are non-circulating. Um, what does this mean? Uh, you cannot bring them out, okay? And in addition to that, so if you can see the picture on the right, this is um, the general circulation section of the Rizal Library. And you can see that you have tables for users, and right there you can see the shelves of books and other materials, which you can peruse and browse freely for what interests you or what you need for whatever project you're working on. However, in an archive, this is not the case. Usually, um, the stacks are not accessible. They are in a space that is closed off from 
outsiders. Um, and it's only accessible usually to the staff. So you go there, you have to have some idea of what you need or what you're looking for, and you make a request to the staff and they bring this out to you. Sometimes uh, it can be a box like what you see here, which are archival boxes. Sometimes it's just one envelope or sometimes it's just one folder depending on what um, you requested. And after you've read it, you've looked through it, you return it. So all of this happens within the site of the archive, within what, what usually is called a reading room, okay? The other big difference is um, in a library, when books or other materials, uh, you know, get used frequently, you have wear and tear. And if it's worn out, it's usually gotten rid of and then replaced with a new copy. However, this is something we usually can't do with archival materials, okay? The contents are often unique and thus irreplaceable, hence greater attention placed on preservation and security because the idea is it's not just being used for now. There has to be some, some way of making sure that researchers and users in the future can access it. Of course, with technology, one of the ways that we can uh, ensure this is through digitizing, but some materials because of fragility or certain conditions don't always lend themselves to this. So um, some of them are in a precarious state. And this is why uh, you have part very particular procedures in archives, okay? So I hope that's clear. Now let's go to the idea of a women's archive, all right? Wait a minute. Okay. So the Women's Archive has its roots in the early decades of the 20th century. Okay. So the creation and establishment of these dedicated archives and women's collections. It's closely connected to the history of women, particularly in the US and Western Europe. The ideas for such collections were catalyzed during that time by the rise of the suffrage movement and other movements promoting women's rights and feminist movement, etc. Okay. So some of the earliest women's archives abroad were established starting in the mid 1930s. Women such as historian Mary Beard and uh, suffragist Rosica Schwimmer played a large role in this initiative, motivated by the need for primary source materials. So this is where we see, um, you know, the, 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 in a lot of ways, the historian's discipline is really intertwined with the use of archives. So the need for primary source materials in the study of women's history because of all of what was happening at that time. Beard saw women as dynamic actors that exerted influence in society and the values that it carried. But there was little record of this. Okay, So in contrast to that idea that women were always oppressed, she wanted to show that you no know, women are also uh, people with agency, dynamic actors in society. But where do we find evidence of this? So Schwimmer proposed the creation of an archive for women and their efforts led to the establishment of the World Center for Women's Archives in 1935. This was one of the earliest women's archives in the US. And Beard's motto for the archive, which she borrowed was, no documents, no history. And through the archive, they saw an opportunity for people, especially women, to study women, not just men, okay? And see how women were 
also significant in shaping society and contributing to society, how women could also be role models. But to do this, they needed evidence and information. Okay. Um, the question was, where were the materials on women to be found since women often had roles that were considered um, domestic or they were they often acted behind the scenes in public spaces so the information needed wasn't as apparent or wasn't as easily found so to learn what women did what they collected materials that were previously not thought of as historically important or um, you know these are historical documents and these included letters diaries journals photographs things that probably we would have lying around the house okay as well as oral histories okay and this is what they tried to collect okay to form the archive now the center itself closed in 1940 but because of what they started it inspired other institutions to document women and begin similar collections dedicated to women okay now in the 1990s there was a resurgence in the creation of women's archives again um, it also uh, happens that in 1995 you have the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action being issued as a result of the fourth World Conference on Women okay, in China and this was aimed at promoting women's rights and gender equality and empowering women by including their concerns in you know the country's policies uh, laws action plans Okay. Now, it also happens that it was in the mid-90s, in 1994 to be precise, that the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings was established. So the point I'm trying to make here is you have these women realizing that the act of record keeping itself is gendered. And they saw that much of the material available uh, even in educational institutions, in universities for study, um, lacked material on women, okay? And they knew that this would affect how women saw themselves, saw their past, okay? So uh, I came across these, I, I think, very valuable phrases, I think, from... Um, this book I was reading, edited by Zanish Belcher, so Perspectives on uh, Women's Archives. And she uses the phrase gendered record keeping and gendered memory making. And it, it's, it's food for thought for us. Okay. So now let me introduce to you what Aliu is, what, what its history is. Okay. So when I was talking about where do we find information on women, um, they began to collect materials that were not really seen as uh, mainstream historical documents for women especially. But eventually, these, this, what you see on the screen is an example of materials that can be part of the archive. This is uh, actually um, used by Alio in developing the collection. So as you can see, personal papers are there. Okay, this it can include personal correspondences, incoming, outgoing, official records can include um, biographical information, your your, your report card when you were a student, legal documents, etc. So writings, manuscripts, uh, cards, photographs. So 
this also goes into non-print material, so audiovisual material, um, which can be tricky because technolo technology changes fast, but you'd have audio recordings. Um, now it's so easy to video, to document, okay? So all of these can be part of the collection. And you normally don't see uh, some of these in the library, okay? All right. So the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings was established in 1994, buoyed by the surge of global interest in women during this decade and frustrated by the lack of local materials and sources on Filipino women. Um, you can see the photos there of these two women. So they came up with a proposal for creating the archive. Okay, so on the left, you can see uh, Dr. Edna Manlapas and from the English department. Okay, and then on the right, you have Dr. Sol Reyes of the Filipino department. So this proposal was presented to the uh, academic vice president of the university. And it gained her support. So the VP at the time was Dr. Patricia Liquanan, um, who until recently was uh, the head of CHED, okay? And she was also a participant in the 1995 Beijing conference. So there was a lot of support for this initiative to create an archive. Um, and at that time, there was also a gender studies committee. So eventually, uh, it got approved. They set it up with a board of directors and an executive director reporting directly to the VP. The mission of the archive was to serve as a permanent facility, okay, responsible for the collection, preservation, exhibition, and promotion of writings by Filipino women. So the core collection started with women writers, okay. The two co-founders, Doctors Manlapas and Reyes served as consultants in building up the core collections of Alio. Um, so they focused initially on writers and worked hard not just to acquire books by Filipinas written in English and Filipino, but especially primary resource materials, uh, manuscript drafts, notes, photographs, letters, journals, etc that would lend context to the writings of these women. And that's what makes the collection unique, okay? Now, on the institutional side, Aleo became a special collection under the Rizal Library a couple of years later in 1996. So by then, the archive was operating with the assistance of a librarian, so just one, tasked with cataloging, organizing, storing, the writings and materials donated to it. So it started as a simple operation. There weren't a lot of materials to work with. And so during the initial years, uh, the goal was really to build up the collection. And a lot of this really went uh, to the personal efforts of uh, not just the founders, but other people who became part of the board. So Within its first year of operation, they obtained, for instance, personal papers of writers like Paz Marquez Benitez, Cecilia Manguera Brainard, Elsa Coscoluela, Angela Manalang Gloria, Paz La Torena, Loretta Parasulit, Parasulit uh, etc. So these were donated. Okay? And later, they added materials of writers like Lina Flor, if you if some of you know Gulong ng Palad, okay, Liwayway Arceo, Rosario de Guzman Lingat, Walhati Bautista, Genoveva Edrosa Matute, among others. And by August 1990, 1999, so five years after its establishment, there were 80 women represented in the collection, all of them writers. Of these 41 were writers in English and 39 were writers in Filipino, many of them considered pioneers in Philippine literature. Now, the thing was, uh, women were not just, you know, writers. So 
in that same year, the board of directors decided to expand the purview of the archive beyond literature to include writings by and about women in other arts and disciplines. So at present, um, Alio just celebrated its 25th year, uh, starting in 2019 to 2020. Uh, the archival collections represent around 212 individual Filipinas and three women's organizations. And the materials span a spectrum of fields, including visual arts, dance, dramatic arts, education, filmmaking, journalism, medicine, social sciences, government, business. So um, all of these fields, okay? And the next few slides will mainly be pictures. And this is to give you an idea of maybe some highlights in the collection, okay? Um, so from writers, there are national scientists. So what you see on the left, is the passport of Encarnacion Alzona from 1927. At that time, the Philippines was still an American colony. And so you will notice that it says in the middle, United States of America, the Philippine Islands. And at the bottom, it is signed by then Governor General Leonard Wood. So this is an example of something unique and unusual that you can find in the archive and it's so different from our passports now. And if you are able to see the details, information such as shape of the face, the mouth, hair, complexion, etc. So all of these physical characteristics are described. Okay. And at the back of this, it, this is like an enormous sheet of paper. Okay. Very big. So you, it, it was folded to be able to go around conveniently. Uh, at the back of it, you'd have all of the stamps from the different countries she visited. So Alzona, you have Fedel Mundo, you have, uh, who, who's, who's a pediatric doctor, uh, Helia Castillo, rural sociology, national scientist, and Mercedes Con Concepcion in demography. Okay? So Alzona was a historian and suffragette and she enjoys the distinction of being the first Filipina to obtain a PhD, a doctorate degree, uh, and it was in history from Columbia University. So her writings on Philippine history contributed to the popularization of the discipline and tackled themes like nationalism, Philippine education, and the status and role of women as active partners in nation building. Okay? So more often than not, we hear of many, many well-known male historians. But sh this is an example of a woman who also gained distinction in this field dominated by men. Okay, So hers, perhaps, is the largest collection in Alio, uh, composed of over 7,000 pieces. Okay? She also provided encouragement to Fedel Mundo a revered figure in Philippine pediatrics and the first woman in Asia to be admitted to Harvard Medical School. So the papers of these women are in the archive. The photo that you see here is of a native incubator designed by Del Mundo because she realized that in rural areas in the provinces, electricity is very unreliable. The incubation machines are very expensive. So she wanted something that people in the provinces could make, won't be too dependent on electricity. It's so there are instructions. She, she had uh, descriptions of them. So the pamphlet for this and the photo is also in Alio. Okay. You also have some examples of national artists. So we were lucky enough uh, to convince members of their family to donate materials. So these include Leonor Orosa Gukinko, national artist for dance. So this is the program for one of uh, the landmark epic dances that uh, she choreographed, she directed, etc. Okay. And then 
on the other side of that is part of the original script for the play The Trojan Women owned by um, Daisy Haveliana. Okay? And you can see the green marks, the annotations showing her own insights as she was working out how to play this role. Okay? So it gives us insight regarding how they did the uh, uh, things at that time, what it looked like, what it felt like. Okay. Um, so just to go through the slides quickly. So you uh, have a number of visual artists. Um, this include Anita Magsaysayho, but perhaps one of the more interesting ones for me would be Nena Sagil. Okay. So there are there is an artwork, but more than that, I think of interest would be her essays and her the page to the right. Okay, she would handwrite this, create drawings on it, compile them. Okay, and at the bottom of the painting that you see, part of her documents also in, in include letters from the Philippine Embassy. Um, talking about a kidney operation that she had to undergo while she was in Paris. Okay, and and here we see insight into the life of this very famous artist, Filipina artist, uh, expatriate. So she lived in Paris, but she never gave up her Filipino citizenship. And so when she got sick, okay, so um, she could not be given uh, welfare benefits by the state of France. And she was treated as an indigent. Okay. And, and so you, you, see, you see this irony of someone who became very famous for her paintings, very sought after for her works, but at the same time uh, struggling to eke out a life abroad. So this is one of the women's artists uh, groups, Kasibulan. Okay. And in the foreground, you have an image of uh, some of the founders, which include Imelda Kahipe and Daya, Julie Luch. Um, so their papers are also in a Leo, and it's an interesting contrast to what you might have for an individual versus an organization and what the dynamics are, how they set it up, uh, the correspondences, the exchanges uh, that took place. Okay. Another group of women, this time journalists, um, is women writers in media now, which you can see the picture here okay, of the group. All right. So many of them are still active journalists up to now. So you have Sheila Coronel, uh, Ceres Doyo, uh, Joan Maglipon, uh, Pauline Paredes, Sikam, Chriselle Dayabes, okay, etc. Many others. Some have gone into publishing, like Karina Bolasco. Uh, all right. So you have this posters by Marilu Diaz Abaya. Okay. Some women who've worked in government, such as the very well respected justice Cecilia Munoz Palma. So the page that you see here was a keynote speech that she delivered in Japan. Okay. So she was one of the big figures in the drafting of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Okay. Mita Pardo de Tavera, who served as Secretary of Health and on the left, you can see pages from health booklets that uh, were produced during her tenure. Okay. And also one of the valuable collections that we have is that of Rosa Henson. Some of you might be familiar with her. So Rosa Henson was a comfort woman 
and she was the first Filipina comfort woman to come out to tell her story in 1992. She held a press conference and it paved the way for other comfort women to come out of the shadows and share her story. And on the left, you can see the drawings that she created uh, illustrating literally her experience under the Japanese as a comfort woman. And the images themselves may look like childish drawings, but if you uh, look at them closely, they're quite harrowing. So this became part of the material that eventually was published um, in a book, her autobiography. Okay? And we also have hundreds of letters that she exchanged with uh, this Japanese uh, professor, Yuki Tanaka. So this correspondence that shows us the processing of her experience. And at the same time, we get a glimpse of her life as she was living it in the 1990s okay, as she was writing her autobiography. So this is really one of the treasures there. Okay. Now, having all of these and more in the collection is not the end goal, okay? The idea of collecting all of these materials is so that people will be able to access them and use them at present and in the future. However, it's not a given that just because you have these materials, people will go to the archive and look them up. So one of the big tasks of the archive based on our experience is to also promote the archive and promote the works of the women represented in the archive. And this involves a village, really. Okay? It necessitates... Uh, a lot of networking, collaboration, partnership with different institutions and individuals within the university and outside of the university. And through these collaborations, um, Aliu has been able to come up with some publications. Uh, so on the upper right, you can see uh, uh, the, a publication that lists materials in the Alzona collection. Um, the two in the foreground give snippets of information regarding some of the women with materials in the collection. So, so it basically gives potential users an idea of what they might find and hopefully they will visit the collection and see its value. Okay. Now, in an effort to reach a wider audience, we have also expanded into other projects. So the book, Many Journeys, Many Voices, actually uh, came out of a study on Filipina overseas workers conducted by the Institute of Philippine Culture in Ateneo. So it was turned into a book with visuals, paintings. And in 2015, it actually won an award. So it, it was quite something to be proud of. And the following year, this turned into a play, a one-act play written by Christine Belen and directed by Jerry Respeto. And what we have done in order to not just raise awareness about women in the collection, but raise awareness regarding issues pertaining to women is that a kit was created for the play. And this kit is available for free for those who want to stage the play in their own institutions. In fact, it has been staged twice in Dubai uh, through the efforts of the Philippine Embassy. And it really resonated with uh, the Filipina workers over there. So this is one of the ways in which 
though we started as an archive, the archive becomes a vehicle or a springboard for talking about uh, the situation women find themselves in at present. Okay. All right. So just to wrap up, okay, wrap up what we have here. Um, two slides, okay. Creating a women's archive is not easy. There are really a lot of challenges, okay, and there are many questions to be asked. Though the collection in Alio right now seems quite impressive, 200, over 200 women, etc. The materials are very uneven. Some are a whole lot, others are only a few folders. But perhaps among the important questions that we need to ask is who is included in the archive? Okay. Um, it needs a lot of thought. And then where do you find the materials? Where do you find the sources? What kinds of materials Will you put into the archive? What will you not accept because of practical considerations uh, like space or because it's simply not relevant to the purpose you have in mind? And then the very practical question of once you've identified the who and the what, how do you get it? More often than not, it takes a lot of... It, it, it's a personal relationship. Um, you have to be able to talk to the families of these women or the women themselves. And in a lot of ways, it's also an act of trust, um, allowing the archive to house particular materials. Okay? And in the absence of tangible records, something that you can hold on to, what can you have instead? We have audio recordings. I don't know if Dr. Vina Lanzona is around, but among the materials we have are her cassette recordings of um, the hook women she interviewed while she was doing her research, which eventually was published uh, in Amazons of the Hook Rebellion. Okay. So the other important thing we have to remember is the challenge of inclusivity and representation. Okay. So if we look, for example, at Alio, there is a certain uh, level of, lim there, there are limitations in terms of representation. Um, many of the women are, come from a background that's educated, um, they had means okay, to pursue their interests, their writings. Okay? Most of them are based in Manila or in Luzon. Much of the language is in either English or Filipino, but we have so many languages in the Philippines. Okay? And limitations of fields or disciplines and practice. So all of this has to be taken into consideration. And the bottom line is, um, it is a good start. Does it represent majority of the women? Of course not. Okay? There's a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, room for improvement in that respect. Okay? And the last bullet point there, there also is the challenge of keeping the collections relevant. Okay? You cannot just say, okay, uh, we're running out of space, we'll just stop, okay? You have to reassess and strategize. How do you resonate with current generations, future generations? So there has to be a certain uh, amount of innovation coming into the mix. Lastly, institutional challenges have to be considered also, okay? Is there available support? space, staff, expertise, funds. A very important question. All of it will be for naught if people cannot access the collection. You have to make it available. You have to make it accessible. 
And it's one of the big challenges we have, especially with things being closed during this pandemic. Okay, so one of the things that's being explored is digitization. Okay, um, it cannot be done alone. Partnership and collaboration uh, is very important. And the bottom line when dealing with an institution is how does it align with the values and vision of the institution, with the values that the institution wants to protect, to project. Um, because in the end, a women's archive is not just a practical facility for learning, for gaining important resource materials. It's also a symbolic space, creating that space for women. Okay? And that is something that is relevant and continues to be relevant in our society, especially now. Okay, so I'll end with that. Uh, just two pictures, then and now, the first uh, space of the archive and the current space of the archive. And maybe a final note that to my knowledge, Aliyo is the first women's archive in the Philippines and might still be the only dedicated women's archive but it cannot do the job alone. And it's my hope that through this talk, seeds are planted such that perhaps some of you might think of also starting collections wherever you are, because there is a lot out there that is waiting uh, for us to put together so that we can all learn from it, okay? So I'll end with that note, thank you. So this is the Facebook page of Alio. The link to the finding aids also is there. So since we have your emails, we can send you this information if you're interested in seeing what we have in the collection. So thank you very much.